Okay, so our, our second presenter for this morning is Alcina Maria de, de Oliveira. Now, Alcina Cortez. You don't need to say my whole name. I'd okay. Say. Alcina Cortez. Al Alcina Cortez. Um, she will be presenting Practices of Exhibiting Popular Music in Portugal When My Music Is Not That of Yours. Um, Alcina has been a curator and museum professional since 1996, notably at Expo 98 Lisbon and at the Science Department of the Calouste Gulbenkian Foundation. A graduate in musicology and postgraduate in popular music studies, she is now working on her doctorate in ethnomusicology and museology under the supervision of Professor, Professor Salwa El Shawan Castelo Branco and co supervision of Dr. Noel Lobley at Pitt Rivers Museum. Alcina is seeking to effectively communicate scientific knowledge about music in museums and to bring innovative and significant contributions to the sector by broadening the practice of exhibiting and interpreting musical sound in museums. Her research interests address ethnomusicology, sound studies, museum studies, narratives in music museums, discourse analysis, musical sound as an artifact, phonogram collections and sonorous archives, and musical ma material collections. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. So, good morning. I would like to start by giving my thanks to the organization for having given me the opportunity to join this interesting international conference to share my ideas in thought. In this presentation, I will focus the current practices of exhibiting popular music in Portugal through the discussion of a case study. The analysis of this case study led me to the belief that there is a trend for curators of popular music to use the exhibition to foster their personal tastes and identity. But first, let me give you a quick overview of my presentation. So, I'll start by giving you a general overview of the exhibition in focus, followed by the discussion of its written narrative, its visual narrative, and its sonic narrative. And I will then discuss the implications of the practices adopted by the curator of the exhibition and present my conclusions. So, as an introduction, although popular music has recently been recognized as heritage, it has never been traditionally exhibited or even acknowledged in museums and therefore there is no established expertise or time-tested practices on how to effectively exhibit it. Having this in mind, I believe there is a need to international map and characterize the, cu the current practice to explore where we can think of innovative and significant contributions. This being the case, I conduct a study to map and analyze popular music exhibitions that took place in Portugal from 2007 to 2013. Data analysis of this study suggested two kinds of curatorial approach, each giving way to a particular heritage discourse. One created by curators with an, with an academic background, which is very scarce. In fact, I have only mapped one exhibition curated by an academic and the other by curators who are music lovers and record collectors with a clear emphasis on the latter. On the basis of this data, I felt the need to critically analyze the curatorial practices of the group of record collectors and music lovers in order to ascertain their prevailing knowledge about popular music and the interests underlying their discourses. So, this presentation gives an account of one of the case studies addressed by the study, that of the traveling exhibition, The Magic of Vinyl, The Music That Changed Society, which originally went on display, on display in 2008 in Portugal and was curated by a music lover and a record collector. The analysis was twofold. On one hand, I conducted in-depth interviews with curators and executive producers. On the other hand, I placed an emphasis on the study of the exhibition itself. This has comprised the analysis of the textual, visual and sonic narratives of the exhibition. 
But before f f focusing the analysis in detail, let me give you more details about the exhibition. The curator of the exhibition owns a collection of over 10,000 records covering almost all musical genres, including pop rock, jazz, ethnic, ethnic music, classical music, electronic music, and contemporary music. The exhibition aims to highlight and acknowledge the popular music and musicians of the Anglo-American early vinyl record era, as well as French, Brazilian, and Portuguese music. The temporal focus is places on the period of vinyl's emergence, namely from 1955 to 1975, which the, the curators see as a groundbreaking era in Western cultural life. A broad set of popular musical genres is thus addressed, such as pop, rock, jazz, soul music, and so forth. <coughs> From the display of what the curators see as the most important works release, released by the most important musicians. This is an overview of the exhibition, of course. And now let's move to written narrative. So, Beginning with the textual analysis, my first step was then to analyze all the text displayed by panels. The exhibition itself starts with a large introductory panel and then unfolds into several sections introduced by a sentence or a couple of sentences each. But before giving my account of the analysis, some prior insights about the analytical concepts used are required. Exhibitions, exhibitions ended up being narratives that convey contents and meanings, and so they must, they must be approached with a critical eye. As such, textual analysis focuses the study of textual panels by drawing on the methods of discourse analysis. Discourse analysis has originally been developed by Michael Halliday in the second half of the 20th century, its distinctive feature is the assumption that texts are st structured by their respective uses and functions, and so this, had, this led to an analytical framework that establishes, between re that establishes relationships between texts and contexts. And this is clear distinct from understanding the language processes exclusively through the study of its grammar. Two tools, sorry, two tools are at the core of the analytical processes. The first analytical tool that I'd like to introduce is genre. Put it so simply, a textual genre is a relatively, a relatively stable shape that resides in all writing, giving it body and structuring social occasions. Ultimately, Genre is a, an invisible shape and it conveys a purpose. I know it's very, very hard to understand, but essentially, if readers recognize the generic shape that is being used, they will attend the social purpose and meaning of the text. There is a long standing work providing a specific framework for genre analysis within the domain of text panels of museum exhibitions. It was developed by a group of Australian researchers and identifies the most common genres thus far used as templates of meaning construction in museums to be the report, the explanation, the recount, the procedure, the exposition, and the discussion. Each genre has his own identifiable purpose, a structure to support that purpose, and the propensity to enable distinctive social relations with the audience. In line with this, when analyzing a text in the light of the tool genre, the question we need to ask so that we can identify its underlying genre is, what is the purpose of the text? So, as to our exhibition, the several text panels mainly show three purposes and the correspondent genre. The first one, the, re, uh, the, the purpose of informing by retelling events, typically using the recount genre. The purpose of describing the musical panorama between 1955 uh, and 1975 is also visible, thus revealing some features of the report genre. 
and also the purpose to put forward an argument, thus revealing features of the genre exposition. Bibliography has been ascribing the recount and report genre, the two first, to have a regulatory and pedagogic function contributing to the museum's conventional role of explaining phenomena in terms of its dialogical stance, the, the literature supports the preposition that when interacting with these types of junks, visitors are given the right to receive the information as unproblematic and trustworthy, trustworthy and not to internally construct it, as it might be the case of a contemporary museum. So, having finished Jean, let's go to the register. The second analytical tool that I'd like to, to draw your attention to is that of register. Let's have also a quick overview of how it works from the theoretical point of view. Register analysis offers very insightful information, not only about the representation of the team by the curator, but also about interaction of potential of the text so it seeks to answer to the following questions. Who are the participants in the text and, and in what processes are they engaged with? Participants include both the doer and the receiver of the processes. It could be me, you, objects, animals, and so forth. Processes means the actions that participants are engaged in along the text. The grammar of experiences divides the world into six different actions realized through uh, the, the, the different kinds of verbs. And these actions are material, mental, relational, verbal, verbal, existential, and behavioral. So, I know it's a big, uh, it's a little bit hard, but uh, okay, so let's go on. As to our exhibition, in terms of register analysis, Several musicians, genres, and cultural movements relate to popular music are the most frequently mentioned participants. In terms of processes used, represented by verbs, relational ones conveying actors' possessions and attributes are largely present, thus conveying a classificatory and descriptive stance. Examples, one example is, Rock and roll is a mix of elements from country and written blues. So the verb is conveying an attribute to, to rock and roll. This is only uh, one example. There's a lot of them, but I'm only presenting one each. There is also a substantial number of other processes. One of them is existential processes, which are, which are likely to be conclusive and thus <coughs> construct the world of Certainties. An example is, and there were, of course, great jazz singers such as Billy Holly or Ella Fitzgerald. The verb is confirming a existence uh, that the jazz singers are great because they say, and there were. Other lexical choice play an interesting, an interesting role. Evaluative and hierarchical lexical compositions are clearly the most evident. A few examples are the most well-known, some of the best and most misunderstood music, and there are many, many, many others. Also, there is a notorious mentioning of qualities of values judgments ascribed to, to participants. Some examples are amazing, remarkable, beautiful, decisive, emblematic, star, eminent, famous, ingenious, and genuine. To sum up, classificatorial processes are very evident. These, in conjunction with the significant use of evaluative and hierarchical lexical compositions, and an extensive use of qualities of valuous judgments ascribed to participants, builds a sharp distinction between the universal figures positively highlighted by the curator and the others that are not mentioned. This type of construction predisposes the visitor, sorry, this type of construction predisposes the visitor to acknowledging the personal appraiser of the curator 
as it in fact ascribes value to music within the curator's own aesthetical choices. Ultimately, it constructs a hierarchical, a hierarchical world where music is divided into good and bad music, in other words, into the music of the, cu of the curator and the music of the others, and therefore presents a particular vision of reality. In addition, this encodes the ideology of binary opposition, where meanings are generated through a, contracts, a contrast between positive and negative. Mikula's understanding of binarism is that this is not a universal principle, and so there is a need for its disconstruction rather than a reinforcement. At the same time, by stating aesthetical evaluations, the curator might be attempting to ascribe the significance of art music to popular music, and also the interview with the curator firmly has support this idea. As mentioned before, this course analysis also allows us to scrutinize the text's potential to interact with visitors. And ultimately, the way in which a curator constructs the interactivity of the texts has meaning in such. Actually, interactive texts point to a world where the curator places himself at the same level as the visitor, whereas a low level of interactivity reinforces the curator's expertise in relation to the visitor's status of novice. So, how can the curator achieve interactivity? The literature on museum studies has specifically linked objectivity and the written mode with a more formal and distant stance, and subjectivity and the spoken mode with inter interactivity in the proximity with the audience. As to our text in, in, in this exhibition, resources typical of the written text mode are not extensively used, but on the other hand, a wide range of musical movements and musicians are often mentioned, and this might be behind, beyond the range of knowledge of many of the visitors, and thus comply it with the written mode and distance. F furthermore, all the texts are written in the third person, and thus they conceal the writer's subjectivity and assign ultimate authority to the content. To, to, to the content. This linguistic device could be said to be the result of a very conventional museum practice. It, it inherently fosters a relationship that establishes the roles of expert and novice. And now let's move on to focus the visual narrative. From the point of view of the visual narrative, 500 record sleeves were exhibited which demonstrates a primary choice to exhibit objects of material culture and indicates a conventional exhibitive approach that seems to have been clearly inherited from traditional museum practices. Nevertheless, it was decided to, scan, decided to scan the sleeves and reproduce them on panels due to the high cost of insurance for exhibiting the actual objects many of which were almost unique examples. So this also meant the exhibition could become a traveling exhibition and could therefore be taken on to and set up very easily elsewhere. So as the actual sleeves ended up being substituted by reproduction, the extraordinary value ascribed to real objects was not clearly exploited in this exhibition. As to the selection of the records, it was entirely in the hands of the curator. And nevertheless, in the interview, the curator was absolutely vague about the exact criteria he used to make his selection or to identify the best or the most important musicians or records, so often mentioned in the text panels. So ultimately, this also testifies to a practices where the, the curator is addressing his taste specifically and greatly reinforce the rationale of a mismatch between my kind of music and, your, and yours, it identified in the textual analysis. 
some other points are very worth to be noted, but we have no time, so let's move to the final level of, of analysis, that of sonic narrative. As I, can show, as I can't show you images about the exhibition of sound, I opted to show you some other views of the, of the exhibition. But now I'm going to speak about the sonic narrative. For the specific purpose of complementing the exhibition with music, the curator recorded a randomly selection of approximately 24 hours of popular music. Displayed, displayed all day, every day from the opening to the closing of the exhibition. Nevertheless, the musical sound was secondary because in the interview, the curator clearly showed that it was the slips, not the sounds, that constituted the major item in the exhibition. Following this analysis, I would like to reflect on the implications of the conceptual world and museum practices outlined above for the public understanding of popular music. In terms of the concepts of popular music that were enabled by the exhibition, the analysis suggests a tendency for the music lovers and record collectors group of the curators to attach a primacy to first, reproducing their own ontologies of popular music on the basis of experiencing music as an object of personal ownership. Although this approach reflects common Western production and conception of popular music, music studies have significantly taken our understanding beyond this, with the result that this kind of act of remembers, remembers cannot be claimed to be plural and inclusive. Of course, universal appeal cannot be achieved <coughs> at any time, but I advocate in the awards that are inclusive and address several spaces of individual understanding. understanding. The, the experience of my kind of music versus your kind of music is extremely deeply rooted and plays a proeminent role in Western society. <coughs> Indeed, records have given music, music the opportunity to become an object that could that could be easily owned. Records have come to crystallize a moment, thereby giving people the opportunity to retrieve that moment whenever they wish. And this has led to music being the subject of dispute. Also, a historical rationale has been assumed. Nevertheless, it is based on a more conventional processes of everyday historical categorization by specifically hierarchizing the most important music and musicians. Also, a collection's concept was used to structure the exhibition, not only this specific exhibition, but mostly all the exhibitions met in the study are based on a prior collection of record sleeves. The fact that, the fact that there was a prior private collection of records suggests not only the exhibition of the curator's identity, as it points also to a conventional approach based primarily on the use of material culture. In fact, the open-ended condition of sound has traditionally pushed it into being, into being a non-exhibitive subject, and this in conjunction with the long-standing encouragement of silence in museum contexts has led to the great intention to use records to represent the, material the materiality of popular music. So, in this presentation, I have argued that music <laughs> museums, representations of popular music in Portugal at the beginning of 20th century, mainly convey partial representations of their complexity. I have identified and discussed the underlying trend of popular music to be globally framed as to enable the curator's identity to be evident. But the point is that music studies have been producing fresh and insightful ideas about the complexities of popular music that are impatiently waiting for to be told to the general public. Accordingly, there is a need for music studies to actively engage with museum studies to meet the challenges of effectively musicalizing popular music. 
At the same time, museum studies are pushing museums to adapt to a plural public, to their <coughs> interests, interests, and to their emotional ability to broaden their knowledge. So furthermore, technology has today the abilities to strikingly exhibit music so as to allow true, truly engagement and interpretations based on emotional experiences. So this means, this is as soon as he says, only the actors are required for the play to start. Thank you so much. Thank you.